uh, joining today. Thanks for coming on. Um, this is the October 15th meeting of the Oregon Department of Energy to talk about um, our rulemaking process and provide an overview for our rules for building performance standards. Uh, we'll be getting started here in just a couple minutes. We'll let a few more folks kind of log on and, um, and get going, but we'll be talking about just uh, a general overview of our energy use intensity average analysis and target setting process, and then provide a general overview of our rules and our draft rules and the different sections that are now posted on our website as part of our formal public comment and review process. Hey there, everybody that's joining. Uh, thanks for logging on. We'll get going here in just a, a couple minutes. Maybe maybe give it to like 103 to get going. Let everybody get logged in and, and settled. So everybody knows we're gonna record the record the meeting today so we can uh, have it for our records and then post it up on the website. Thanks everybody for joining. Um, my name is Blake Shalide. I'm the manager of the codes and standards section at the Oregon Department of Energy. And today we're going to provide an, an overview of our um, our building performance standards rulemaking, kind of all the activity that we've that we've done throughout the course of the year. You've probably seen that our our rules are filed with this, our draft rules are filed with the Secretary of State, and they're open for public comment and review now. But we thought that now, like during the open public comment period, would be a great time to have uh, a, another kind of interim meeting in the middle of the comment period to set the stage and provide a, a broad overview of the rules in case folks are wanting to review and comment um, to kind of provide just some grounding for, for the different sections and, and what's in there. The rules themselves are fairly lengthy as everyone who's kind of been involved in the process knows. So we heard some feedback from our advisory committees that it would be a good opportunity just to revisit where our energy targets, our energy uh, average, process uh, kind of ended up and where the energy targets ended up. And then um, some of the other topics that our, our RAC and advisory committees covered, including the topics of energy data aggregation, reporting requirements, and kind of some of our next steps after we finish this rulemaking for implementation. So that's kind of the meet purpose for the meeting today. Um, so we have our analysis team from SBW and the rest of the team here to talk about energy use intensity targets. So at this point, I think I'll turn it over to them to, to start with that portion of the meeting. Thanks, Blake. I'm going to get my screen sharing here. Okay. Okay. I assume that it is sharing correctly. Hi, everyone. I am Anna Kelly with SBW Consulting. Uh, just to let you know up here on the top of this deck, which is available on the rulemaking website, are QR codes that take you to the Q&A from our last public meeting, uh, the rulemaking portal for the building energy performance standards, as well as to a memo describing the methodology used to develop the energy use intensity targets that we are going to be going over again today in this meeting. For those of you who are not familiar with using WebEx, um, you can find this PowerPoint on the 
on the website where you uh, found the agenda and it can give you some information about how to use WebEx, but also just keep in mind, there's the raise hand feature, there's a chat. Um, and if you wanna ask questions later on in the meeting, you will have to toggle on and off of mute. Otherwise, um, this is going to be a pretty short a uh, pretty short presentation that will lead into a facilitated discussion. I'm going to be walking us through kind of the UI rulemaking in general, the BEPS rulemaking, and then Poppy Storm from the 2050 Institute, who did a lot of the target calibration and development, is going to be walking you through kind of the in-depth methodology as well as the targets. And then we are going to have Kirsten from Unruh Solutions walk us through a facilitated discussion on the topic. I want to thank everybody who was involved in this project from Blake through the analysis teams and everyone else who was involved. This was a colossal effort to put these targets together and this team did excellent work real on a very fast timeline to get this done. And you can see that timeline here. We had our very first uh, advisory committee meeting back in July, and we are here right in the center in that green text at this second public comment meeting. The rulemaking is open until the end of the year, and the public comments are going to be ending mid next month. And so you have about a month left uh, to get your thoughts together and to start put together putting together the comments that you want to make on these targets and on the rulemaking. As for the compliance timeline, after the rulemaking is completed at the end of the year, notifications are going to actually begin next summer. So this is a really fast timeline to let those tier one and tier two building owners get started working on building performance standards compliance. As you can see, we are going to be working really diligently over the next six years through the end of the decade to get through the first compliance period for the tier one buildings and to get the tier two buildings started up so that they can then work towards compliance. The building energy performance standards came about through House Bill 3409 here in Oregon, and it kind of had three primary components. The first one was simply establishing the building performance standards for commercial buildings greater than 35,000 square feet. There were two other components. I'm gonna go over the third one next and come back to the average EUI. The, sec the third one is the compliance pathways. And this is saying that buildings can choose based off of their unique scenarios, how they are going to comply with the building performance standards that have come about. There are, there's the target-based compliance, which we'll be going through today, and then there are other ways that buildings can comply. I know Blake is going to go into some of that at the end of this meeting. And so I just wanted to prime you with that in advance. But what we're gonna be talking about with the SBW team over the rest of this presentation is the average EUIs and the targets. So in House Bill 3409, the state was directed to set energy use intensity targets for a list of specific building types. What we have done here is create those targets, but there was a key detail that they had to be based off of the average energy use intensity for each building type. And the target cannot be lower than that. So it cannot be more stringent than the average for those buildings. And so what we did here and what we'll be talking about is the process of figuring out what that average was. One thing that you will discover throughout this process, if you don't already know it, is that there's no one perfect data set that can be used. We can't just find out what the average is by metering every building. We have to use data that exists out in the world and construct these averages. So I would like to welcome Poppy Storm to continue the rest of the conversation and walk you through kind of how those averages got put together and then turned into targets for Oregon. Poppy, take it away. Yeah, thank you, Anna. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm Poppy Storm from 2050 Institute. And as Anna mentioned, the average EUIs are really critical for setting the energy use intensity targets for the state of Oregon. So I'm going to do a quick overview of the three step process that we used for developing the average EUIs. 
So the first step here on this slide is the data collection. We gathered all the EUI data from various sources. We're going to go over some of those sources in the subsequent slides, but it really is focused mostly on regional, which is Northwest data from the four Northwest states of Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and Montana, and also national data, but taking into consideration uh, climate adjusted EUIs as opposed to all of the standard EUIs. And then we're also looking at some local EUI data. And then our second step in this process of developing average EUIs for Oregon is to look at what are the average EUIs for the entire Northwest, because a lot of our data sets are actually Northwest based and not Oregon based. And the most recent version of that is from 2019. So we're calling this step to 2019 Northwest average EUIs. And the objective there is to determine the baseline EUI for the entire Northwest. And we're combining regional and national data to establish that 2019 EUI. And so for all of the building types that we're looking at for this target setting process, and we're combining the regional and national data in a way that leverages wherever possible, the regional data and just fills in with national data that is climate adjusted when and where we don't feel like we have either any EUI for that building type, or we don't feel like we have a reliable EUI. So once we establish that 2019 EUI for all of the building types for the whole Northwest, then we're trying to take a closer look and see if there's any way that we can make it more applicable to Oregon. So step three is developing Oregon average EUIs. And in this case, we're tailoring to other EUI benchmarks we have for Oregon, for example, from the city of Portland benchmarking. We're also looking at some other Oregon data sets. And so we're looking at making adjustments to specific building types, but we're also looking at making adjustments for the time gap between 2019 and 2027, which is when the first compliance year begins for the largest cohort of buildings. Next slide. So there are several ways to develop average EUIs and all of those data sets that I was referring to the national and the regional, for example, those are representative samples. So that's what we see on the right side here. And that's where we're taking a representative sample of buildings from a much larger set of buildings, um, all of the buildings in a specific region. And we're using that sample to develop the average EUI. There are other ways of developing average EUIs, and that's just to take the entire census of buildings for a specific area. Unfortunately, we don't have that census of buildings for the entire state of Oregon, but we do have a representative sample of the Northwest, and we also have a representative sample of the national EUIs. When it comes to the local and Oregon EUIs that we're using to supplement in that step three, we do have some census data sets and we're relying on those to make some adjustments. So basically, we're trying to use the best available data whenever possible. So to summarize here, we have various data sets available for the average EUIs. We have the Northwest Regional Data, which is called the Commercial Building Stock Assessment, CBSA for short, and that is developed by the Northwest Energy Efficiency Alliance. And then we also have climate adjusted national data, which is called CBEX. It's the Commercial Building Energy Consumption Survey, and that's a national data set. And then we also have Oregon and Washington data. So we're trying to get as representative a data set as possible, ultimately across all of the climate zones and uh, markets across the Northwest and Oregon. Next slide. So what that all um, came together as in our 2019 regional EU average EUIs is a specific EUI for all of the building types for the CBEX data set, which is the national data set, and those are weather adjusted EUIs. And then we also have in black all of the CBSA average EUIs. So 
the actual details of where these exact EUIs are landing isn't um, all that important unless you want to dig into those details. But the main reason why we're showing this is just to show that these are the starting point for figuring out what our uh, regional, our Northwest EUIs are. So we're comparing the CBACs to the CBSA data sets to figure out what our 2019 Northwest average EUIs are. Next slide. So the way that we did that is that when we felt like we had reliable data and we had enough, uh, enough buildings for that type, for example, you can see administrative professional office in the middle here, it says CBSA for the green bar. The green bar in all of these um, bar charts is showing the EUI that we chose. And this is all of the different types of office buildings. And so that one in the middle and other office, those both say CBSA. So we were able to take directly from the North, the regional data set, we were able to take that EUI. But then when you look over to the right, you see government office and medical office non-diagnostic, it says CBEX in the green bar. And in that case, you can see we didn't have a, a CBSA gray bar. We didn't have enough buildings for, or any buildings in this case, for that particular building type. So in that case, we really had to take the CBEX uh, EUI. But again, that is weather adjusted to align with the specific uh, climate zones in the state of Oregon. And then there were a couple other areas where it says CBEX adjusted, and that's where we didn't feel like we had as reliable enough data as we would like for the regional data, the CBSA, but we decided to make an adjustment in terms of the error bounds for the CBEX data. So we adjusted the CBEX data so that it was a little closer to the Northwest um, regional data, just so that we could have kind of a, a happy medium there. So all of these came together for all of the building types. It's a total of 40 building types. We have a selected EUI from these overall data sets to develop our 2019 Northwest average EUIs. And then we move on to actually tailoring those to Oregon. And we're definitely happy to answer any questions. Um, if you have any questions on the details, we'll have plenty of time at the end to answer those questions. So this side uh, goes over our approach to then tailoring the EUIs to Oregon. So we wanted to make the Oregon, we wanted to make Oregon adjustments to specific building types where warranted. And we also wanted to understand the trends over time so that we could adjust the average EUIs to 2027. So in establishing our Oregon average EUIs, we compared to Oregon specific data, and that was mainly for public buildings and for schools. And that's where we had near census samples. So we had very large data sets, particularly for schools that were highly reliable. We also had uh, benchmarking data from the city of Portland and also the city of Seattle. And so we were comparing all of those data sets against that 2019 Northwest average EUI data set that we had developed. And then we recommended custom organ adjustments to specific building types. So we literally went through every single building type and manually understood what was going on across all of these building types um, across all of these various building type data sources to understand where we might be able to make some adjustments. And so we applied custom adjustments to a handful of specific building types. And we also developed and applied a 2027 adjustment factor to establish the Oregon average EUIs for 2027. Next slide. So this is an example of the uh, educational buildings. So this is one of the series of building types where we made adjustments to align better with the Oregon data sets. So if you see here, we have three main educational 
building types. We have elementary, middle school on the left. We have other classroom education in the middle, and we have high schools on the right. And so our Northwest average UI is the green bar. Then we have a Washington average UI, which is mostly based on the same data as the Northwest average UI. So you don't see a lot of difference there. But you then do see a difference when you look particularly at the Oregon schools data. And this is a very robust data set. It's a near census sample. We have uh, more than a thousand schools and we have five years of EUIs across all of the individual schools. And what we see here is that um, the Oregon schools are slightly lower and a little bit more uh, reduced for some building types, for example, for the elementary middle schools. So this is a, a really solid data set and we've recommended uh, making adjustments to the Northwest average EUIs to reflect this Oregon schools data set. And I'll provide a summary of that in a couple minutes. Next slide. The only other building type where we recommended uh, making an adjustment and where we felt like we had um, the justification for doing so with available data sets is in the restaurant cafeteria category. So if you see the green bar on the on the far left and then also the gray bar for the Washington average EUI, the Northwest average EUI for restaurants is very high and it doesn't align with a lot of the other data sets. And so we feel like this is a little bit of an outlier we're not sure if there were maybe uh, a number of other building types maybe included in with that, maybe some much higher using types like fast food. It's unclear, but it's significantly higher than a lot of our other data sets. So we felt like it was reasonable to make an adjustment here. And so what we're looking at mainly is the Seattle benchmarking data, the Portland benchmarking data, and also the national data, the CBEX data. And the CBEX data is that orange bar on the far right. So in looking at all three of those data sets, we see that they're significantly lower than the Northwest average EUI. The Seattle benchmarking data set is about half and um, the Portland benchmarking data set is even lower. There may be some issues there, for example, in the Portland benchmarking data set, there can be issues with how building types are classified. So we're not recommending that we select the Portland benchmarking data or even the Seattle benchmarking data. They're too low. But we do recommend using the CBEX uh, data EUI as a starting point. And what we ultimately recommended is that if you see the difference between the CBEX average EUI and the top of the Northwest average EUI, which is in the green. So you're comparing that green to the orange and there's about 200 uh, points difference between those and we went somewhere in the middle. So we basically took the CBEX average EUI and we added about 100 points to it. So it's right about in the middle between the top of the orange and the top of the green. And that's all, uh, just those four building types are the only types that we recommended making custom adjustments for Oregon. Next slide. So we also looked at trends in building energy use. And one of the most significant trends is a reduction in energy use over time. So again, we're looking at uh, national and regional data sets that are from around 2018 and 2019, because these are fairly significant undertakings and they're only done every five years. So we don't have the newest data available yet for these building types. But as you can see between 2012 and 2018 in the national data, there is a reduction in nearly all of these um, building types. So you see the yellow is the 2012 and the blue is the 2018. And the average that they estimated for this CBEX national data set is that the average across all building types was about 10%. Next slide. 
Now we're looking at the average EUIs for the Northwest, and they also decreased from 2014 to 2019. The green bar is 2014. The blue bar is 2019. So in almost all building types, except for hospitals, which they believe was an adjustment in their methodology, we also see a significant decrease. And in many cases, it's actually well over 10%. And that's the same that we saw in um, the national data. But the national data is more than 6,000 buildings, and they also went through the process of doing a detailed calculation of that trend. And so that's the trend that we're relying on for our recommendations here. Next slide. So this is a summary of all of the different data sets and whether or not we saw a trending down over time which is this first row, and then also whether or not we recommend using that trend line for the 2027 adjustment factor. And so if you go across the board in terms of, twin, go across the table in terms of trending down over time, the CBEX, yes, it's trending down over time. It's an average of 10%. CBSA is the next column. We also see a trend down there. Oregon State owned buildings is an NA, as is Portland benchmarking. There were some issues with the classification of the building types, and so we were not able to estimate a trend line for those, um, those data sets. But we did also see a definite trending down for Oregon schools and that data, which was a census data sample, and we see the trend down and decrease in EUIs for the Seattle benchmarking. But ultimately, in terms of recommending for the 2027 adjustment factor, the only box we have here with a yes is the CBEX because we feel like that is the most robust data set with the re most robust analysis that we feel like we can rely upon to establish that trend for the state of Oregon. Next slide. So to summarize our process for this trend adjustment, we're adjusting the Oregon average EUIs to the 2027 benchmark because that's required in the HB 3409. It's required that the average EUIs are the lowest um, possible for those targets. And so we're establishing average EUIs for 2027, which is that first measurement year with a June 1st, 2028 reporting deadline, but the measurement year is the year before. And then we're calculating it as a 1.7% reduction per year. And that is calculated based on the 10% reduction that we saw in the national data set. And so there's eight years between 2019 and 2027. And so we calculated a 13.6% total trend factor to establish the average EUIs for 2027. And then we applied that trend factor to the 2019 Northwest average EUIs with those adjustments for the specific building types. Next slide. So just um, to recap here, we made a custom adjustment for elementary middle schools, for high schools, for other classrooms, and we also made an adjustment for restaurants, which is uh, amounts to about a 23% reduction. And then we also did this trend reduction, which is about 1.7% per year. This is based on the CBEX data, which is a large population of buildings greater than 6,000 buildings. It's a representative sample. It's highly vetted data and highly vetted analysis. And it is also a conservative estimate because it is calculated pre-COVID, so it doesn't have the influence of any of these reductions in EUIs that happened after COVID. Next slide. So that ultimately delivered the Oregon average EUIs. And there isn't really a lot to see here, except that we have uh, all of our 
approximately 40 building types represented here. And this is the starting point Oregon average EUI upon which the targets can be based. And so as Anna mentioned, that, that is an important part of this whole process. So a lot of our methodology was focused on really getting these Oregon average EUIs right to the best of our ability with all of the available data and the most recent available data. Next slide. So then the next step in the process was actually developing the targets and we needed to base those targets on a set of target setting criteria, which are mostly reflected in the House Bill 3409 itself. And so our targets, not exactly the ones that are included here, we, we have um, an average across the climate zones, but the EUI targets that are included in the draft rule are weather normalized net energy. They are also um, required to be equal to or greater than the average EUIs. So that's a consideration that cannot be any lower, but they can be higher. And they need to include two or more climate zones, which they do in the actual draft rulemaking. They also need to adjust as necessary for unique energy using features. They need to consider regional and local building energy use, which is what we just described in our process. They need to exclude EV supply equipment. And last but not least, they need to maximize uh, GHG reductions. Those are all from the, the law, House Bill 3409. There is also a RAC recommendation, and that's that they recognize flexible loads, but we see this as more potentially EUI target adjacent. It maybe is something that could be incorporated into utility programs, but we did want to at least include that because it was an important contribution from the RAC. So the Department of Energy basically assessed the average EUIs that we just presented against this target setting criteria. And with the RAC, we discussed implications for making changes. And the main question was, should the targets be any different than the, the average EUIs? And then also there was a need to consider the rationale for any changes and then finalize the draft targets. Next slide. So ultimately, the Department of Energy recommended the Oregon average EUIs without making any additions to those EUIs. So that's the minimum EUI that could be used as a target, and that's the recommendation for the targets. And these are the targets in an, an averaged form across the two climate zones. We have them all listed out here. I'm not going to go over any of the details, but we can certainly revisit this, these target setting tables. If you go to the next slide, we also have the rest of the um, building types. And um, at this point, I think that I'm going to hand it back either to Anna or to Kirsten to have a facilitated Q&A. Yeah, it'll be back to me. Thanks, Poppy. Hi, everyone. I am Kristen. I'm here with Unruz as part of the SBW team and here to make sure that all of your questions get answered. So if you want to share any questions either through the chat, you can also raise your hand. We'll call on you to unmute. And there is a Q&A tool as well in the bottom right hand side of your screen. So feel free to submit your questions in whatever format works best for you. And we've got 10 minutes. So you also have a Q&R code on the screen with a link to the Odo comment portal if you want to go and submit formal comments as part of the process. And we've included some of the topics that we've covered just to remind folks and uh, maybe encourage you to ask questions in the areas that you might want a little bit more clarity about. So I will pause and see if there are any questions. And I'll just add there first um, that we definitely do encourage and welcome anybody to submit formal comments via the comment portal or by uh, sending your comments by email to myself or to Wendy Simons, who's our rulemaking coordinator and contact information is up on our website too, but definitely encourage and, and welcome those formal comments to come in. We have a few ra hands raised. Uh, Raymond Douglas has Hi. hand up. Hello, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Yes. 
Great, thanks. My, my name is Ray Douglas. I, I'm with uh, Johnson Controls International. Uh, thanks for the information today. Very helpful. Also, thanks for uh, including me in your uh, committee meetings. Um, a, a couple of questions. One is um, the comment that was just made about formal comments. Is it protocol for formal comments to be emailed to you or, or submitted via the portal uh, versus over the, uh, the call here? Blake, I we are happy to take comments anyway. If you make a comment over yeah. the over the call today here too, it'll it'll definitely be noted. Um, and you know, I, I wouldn't say that either either pathway is uh, you know any more or less likely to reach us and to to get. Um, okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, so just uh, under our consideration. Yeah. So, just want to make yeah. sure. Thank. Thank you, Blake. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so so first of all, uh, Poppy, thanks for the the detailed overview. So as a as a comment from um, a a provider uh, in the marketplace, you know, of HVAC solutions uh, to customers. Um, we, we've obviously been involved in all the various um, geographies that have passed legislation around building performance standards. And, and it, it, uh, I would say that the methodology that you've taken, the data that you've looked at, um, how you took into account climate uh, variation, um, as, as well as statistical analysis that uh, the setting process for the EUI targets looks to be very sound um, and also um, consistent with other markets um, that, that we've been involved with. So um, I, I would just say from, you know, one data point uh, look, looks like a really good sound process that you, that you all use to come to your determinations. Um, secondly, I have a question around government buildings um, and I may have missed this in your presentation. Uh, I know obviously K through 12 elementary schools, those many of those are, are public uh, funded government uh, institutions, uh, but in general, government buildings, administrative buildings, public safety, um, parks and rec, transportation, all that. Um, are there going to be requirements for government buildings to meet or will they receive a, a buy? Uh, good, good question. I can I can cover that. So in general, the public and private buildings are treated the same under the building performance standard as long as they fall within the tier one or tier two classifications. So some buildings like schools, universities, uh, hospitals, multifamily and dorms are tier two buildings that don't need to meet a building performance standard, won't need to meet the energy target, but will need to report and benchmark their energy usage. But um, a government office building would need a if it's over the square footage threshold, would need to meet the building performance standard the same as a privately owned office building. Great, thank you. Yep. Appreciate it. Okay, thanks everyone. So I see we've got a few other hands and we can go to Morgan Allen next. Uh, thank you, uh, Morgan Allen with the School Administrators Association and I'm not a facilities expert at all. So, but I just had a question about the EUI scores for schools. Um, and I think I have a general layperson's understanding of the methodology. The question I had is um, with climate change, the vast majority of school buildings in the state, you know, of our 1500 or so schools do not have air conditioning. And many of our districts are in the process of uh, considering adding air conditioning, which is obviously a heavy consumer of uh, energy. And uh, and would be running those you know significantly in months like August and September, uh, June and May with the higher temperatures. So was there any discussion in the target setting uh, about potential changes that you know I guess any of the buildings would be making because of climate change, um, especially considering the vast majority of school buildings do not have air conditioning and are most likely going to have to add that in the next you know five years. Uh, we actually had multiple school districts, for example, the North Clackamas School District, which is the eighth largest school district in the state, had to shut down for two days. They did not have air conditioning in any of their buildings uh, in the district. Similarly, Portland Public Schools shut down for a day. They only have air conditioning in about 20 of their 85 schools. So was that discussed at all as part of the, the setting, especially since it looks like it's projected to go down over the next few years? But we're gonna probably be bringing systems online that will more likely increase energy consumption. Thanks, Morgan. Poppy, I'm gonna tap you and I think to answer that one. Sure, yeah, I can I can definitely um, start. I, I can say that's an interesting consideration. 
it's not something that we looked at in developing the average EUIs or the targets. So we weren't looking at how we thought buildings specifically would be changing in response to a changing climate. So that um, definitely would be a more complex uh, estimate looking out, especially across the 40 building types. So one thing I can say though, is that ideally if there's um, a change in the heating system as well, one thing to consider is that in some instances, some of that additional cooling could be offset by reductions in energy use for the heating systems, particularly if we're switch switching to heat pump systems, for example, that have uh, cooling and heating together. So certainly that isn't always going to be the case where you're going to have those offsets, but ultimately the buildings will need to progressively reduce energy use over time with this building performance standard. And so what we're really looking at is setting that benchmark and not necessarily um, looking at what all the different conditions that would have to be accounted for to meet those reducing uh, EUIs. But I think that um, happy to answer any additional questions on that. And also Blake, if you have anything to add on that as well. Um, I, I do, yeah. Um, and I, I think it's a great point and a great consideration. Um, the, the targets uh, included some consideration of like actual Oregon energy, schools energy data. Um, and I've worked pretty, closely with our uh, the school's energy efficiency program that we administer at the Oregon Department of Energy in the past and definitely aware that um, cooling is something that's being added to more and more schools over, over time. Um, but I just wanted to note that the energy targets for schools, because schools are a tier two building now and won't necessarily need to meet the building performance standard and meet those EOI targets are mostly for, for reference and for comparison at this point. And one of the tasks that our agency will be doing over the next five years will be to develop a potential recommendation for a building performance standard for those tier two buildings like schools. So through that process and through that analysis, I think we would make considerations just like what you mentioned, like, okay, we've we've got some potential changes due to due to climate change and maybe more uh, more end use energy for cooling to address just hotter, hotter summers and hotter outer classroom. So that would definitely be something that we would look to include in that that analysis. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, thanks everyone. Uh, I'm going to point you Blake to another question in the chat that you might be able to answer in the chat mm -hmm. and I'm going to pass it to Adam Holzcheck and just going to ask folks to try to keep their questions brief, maybe 30 seconds or less so that we can get to everyone's questions today, but I will pass it to Adam. All right, thank you. My name is Adam Holzcheck. I'm with Portland Community College. Um, I understand that uh, you're taking the data set from prior to the uh... to COVID. Uh, I just want to kind of, I guess, reinforce that you know there were significant changes. Uh, our schools saw about a 30% increase uh, coming out of the COVID uh, era uh, that we haven't come back down from. So. That is stopping the analysis in 2019 and then projecting those same reductions through uh, the pandemic might not be entirely accurate. Um, and just curious if that was kind of thought about at all. Awesome. Thanks, Adam. Poppy, I think that's another question for you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, most of the pre COVID data sets were the national data set and the uh, regional data set. So that was 2018 and 2019 respectively. But um, when we were looking at the schools data, we did have data from 20, from post COVID. So it was an average across about five years of data. So we are considering some of that in there. Um, but it's not, we didn't look at it specifically at that building type and make adjustments based on um, changes that happened post COVID. But I would see if maybe Blake has something else to add because it seems like it relates to his previous answer and that's that we're not looking at actual targets right now and some of these other considerations will be looked at when you set the targets in the future for schools. 
Right. Yeah. So that will be part of our future. So one of the elements for tier two buildings is reporting energy data. Um, so in five years, we'll get a lot more data on on the tier two buildings, including schools. Um, that will help us inform our analysis to make a recommendation for a potential building performance standard for those tier two buildings um, at the time. So, you know, at that at that point, we'll have more, you know, more recent, more uh, more annual data to consider. Okay, thank you, Blake. That is our time. I wanted to check in if you're okay if we go a bit over time to answer these questions. Yep. Or okay, yep. awesome. So next, we'll go to Clark Brockman. Hi, thanks for the presentation. Um, Happy during your presentation, you said that uh, the Portland data was not able to be included for statistical reasons. And I wonder if you could just elaborate a little bit as to why, because I it's my understanding the Portland data set's fairly robust. So I'm surprised you weren't able to incorporate it in uh, the final comparison. Yeah, we, we did use it in the comparison. So we had to convert a lot of the building types to align with the typology that we were using. And so we did com do comparisons, um, but in some instances we had questions about how the um, data may have been classified in the Portland data. And so in some cases we um, had suspicions around how it was classified. And what I mean by that is that there are um, really fi a fine level of detail in terms of building types that you can go down to. And then sometimes they're rolled up, so to speak, into um, larger categories. And sometimes there can be variations in how those building types are classified. So there were just some instances, for example, um, when we were doing the comparison, which we were using that data set to do the comparison, there were instances where the um, EUIs were really much lower than some of the other ones. That They were so low that they made us think that it really wasn't representative of a difference in energy use, but that it was maybe some issue with the way that the building types were classified. And in some cases, it was the opposite where it was significantly higher and it was kind of outside of the bounds of what we would expect for that building type. So it was just beyond the scope of this project to go into uh, an extremely detailed assessment of the Portland data set itself. But more or less, there were many instances where we could do a comparison and, and, and kind of gauge against that local data set, but there were some instances where we couldn't. And one of them in particular was that trending data set. We didn't feel confident in whether or not they were going up or down, and many of them were higher or lower than we were expecting. And so we ultimately recommended that we use the, the national trend because it's just a much higher level of uh, number of data points. Okay, thank you. We've got two more questions here with the raised hands and one more in the chat. So we'll go to Vin Mason. Hi, Vin Mason with the city of Portland. Uh, just acknowledging that there are multiple property types often for different buildings and it's all self-reported in terms of their floor area. And it's uh, in be challenging to assign one building, one EUI. Um, I'm curious how that is done. Um, <clears throat> I think we already talked about that. That would be like based on percentages of floor area. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I have two um, questions though for clarification regarding the baseline. So uh, the 2027 calendar year, I think that makes a lot of sense, especially for the larger buildings, 200,000 square feet and larger. I'm assuming that the June, and sorry if this is all in the rules, but um, just to clarify, uh, it'd be helpful to know uh, that the buildings that are reporting June 1st, 2028 are using a 2027 calendar year. The following buildings though, so the mid-sized buildings that are reporting in 2029 and then the smaller buildings in 2030, are they all using the, the same 2027 baseline year? Because it, it sounds like they'll all be using the same baseline EUI. Does yeah, that, they would, sense? in this recommendation, they would be using the same calendar year 2027. So, okay, so we we were we were 
trending out, but we were conservative in using the lower number for the um, using the national CBEX data set. And then we were also conservative in just setting it at 2027. And in a sense, it's kind of like an energy code where you have a certain point in time and then there's about a two to three year time frame where you have compliance with that code or standard. And so we just thought for simplicity's sake and also that um, we would just have uh, a common baseline for all of the building types and then it would change moving forward for the next cycle. So we did it on a cycle basis. Okay, got it. Yeah, and then maybe a question for Blake would be uh, for the buildings that are reporting the following years, are they using the 2027 calendar year? For their uh, baseline, or are they using the, the previous calendar year, like 2028 for 2029 reporting, 2029 for 2030 reporting? Uh, it, it would just be that consistent 2027 um, okay. period target, right? There wouldn't be Got another it. adjustment for one one more year into the future. Yeah, it would just be consistent targets at 2020. And at one point, there was in this space there was a 2024 reference to. Is is that did that present itself in the the draft and the admin rules, or is that just more conceptually at our last RAC meeting? That was, I can answer that one. That was at the last meeting. It was looking at how far out the projection should be. And so in one option would be that we just project it out to the current point in time, 2024, but that's kind of arbitrary in relation to the law. And so there was an option of 2024, 2027. And so we recommended the 2027. And I just wanted to clarify, I'm not sure if this was actually your question, um, Vin, but it is the 2027 baseline. And so that's the average EUI that you're comparing against, which was used for the target. And so whether or not you were complying in 2028, 29, or 30, you would be using that same target, but your, your actual measurement year would be different. So your measurement year would be the prior year from your compliance date. So I just wanted to come, I just wanted to clarify that. Oh yeah, it's thanks not, for that. I did it, understand differently for a minute that it was that everybody had 2027 rather than prior year. Right. Thanks for clarifying that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks so much. And thanks uh, Blake and Anna for answering those questions in the chat. We'll go to Kevin Duell for our last question here. Oh, hi, yeah, thank you for this presentation. Obviously a lot of work. I, I had a question about the universal forecasting percentage and pat particularly pertaining to some of those occupancies that showed a increase in energy use. I, th I was think food sales might've been one of them. Um, I think last time we talked about maybe having more than one factor instead of a universal factor maybe there were a couple and uh, just just curious your thoughts on that yeah we did we decided to take a pretty conservative approach and use the straight estimate that was done for the national data set the cbex data set and so for that data set there that's the average across all of the building types and it's um, maybe in some cases a little bit, it, it's different for some building types, but overall it averages out to 10%. And another reason, a big driver for these reductions is actually lighting. And so that's something that is, is baked into the energy standards at a national level. And so we're estimating that this is likely to catch up with a lot of the other building types as well, that the lighting is not as intensive in some of those other building types, but whenever lighting is um, swapped out in the future, it has to um, align with the national standards and all of the lighting that's actually available. And so that's actually um, putting significant downward pressure across all of the building types. But that was, that was basically the thinking behind it. We decided not to recommend um, going in on an individual building basis because there's about 40 building types 
Um, but it's definitely uh, an interesting consideration and definitely appreciate the comment. Yeah, I was just thinking in food service, the primary energy consumption, I think, is cooking. So, um, and since it seems to be going up, not down, that might be a kind of a double pinch on those folks. But uh, thanks for your comment. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks for your interest. Thanks for your, your thoughtful questions and comments. And uh, we're really looking forward to seeing what else comes in through the comment portal. For now, we are done. Uh, we can share some links in the chat if folks are looking for more information on that, but we are gonna pass it over to Blake to continue the presentation. Uh, thanks, Kirsten. And I'll also just mention that um, also included in the draft rules in table 7-2 of appendix Z, are those energy targets that were just kind of shown to and that were on the on the chart too, but they've been mapped over to the Energy Star Portfolio Manager um, building types. So that's, if you wanted to look at that comprehensive table that kind of maps it to the individual building types. And we pulled that table out and made it its own document up on the website too, just so it's a little bit more, more visible and more transparent there. Um, but that's that's available for, for review as well. Um, okay, I will share my screen too. And now, um, let's see. And now I'm going to go over just the the other parts of our of our rules and our rulemaking process um, today. Um, after we've had that great discussion on the energy use intensity targets. So um, most of the folks here on the call have been involved through our uh, rulemaking advisory committee process and our various public meetings along the way. Um, this is just a summary of all the work that, that we've done so far, mostly regarding the, the building performance standards uh, in tier one buildings. And so here, where we are right now, we filed our rules on September 30th. They are, we're right in the middle of our public review process, the formal public uh, review and comment period. Here we are today on October 15th, having a, a, a advisory committee and public meeting. We have a rulemaking hearing coming up on November 13th, and our rulemaking comment period will be open through the end of that week, through November 15th, where you can still submit written comments by November 15th. And then we'll take the time in between mid-November and the end of the year to review the comments that come in, and um, and we're actively reviewing the comments kind of as they come in now too, um, but. We'll take the time between when the public comment period closes and the end of the year to finalize our, our rules based on some of those comments that come in. But we know that we've already had a lot of discussion and a lot of opportunity for comment um, through our, our RAC process. So um, hopefully a lot of the, you know, a lot of the comments and issues have been have been addressed, but um, you know, we definitely expect that, that there'll be more comments that, that come into that we can that we can look to uh, review and respond to. So we filed the, the draft rules for review, um, including the various sections of the, of the rules. The comment portals are up on the website, multiple avenues for comment, either through those portals or just by directly emailing uh, Odo staff, myself or Wendy Simons. Um, and then just to kind of provide just like an a overview and ground folks for all the different sections of the rules that are up there for review. Um, there's different chapters and the, our comment portals are structured based on the, the category. For example, we have one comment portal for chapters one through three, another comment portal for chapters four through six. Um, so hopefully that kind of helps organize. If you do wanna get in and make a comment just on one topic, you can do that without wading through all of the, all of the comment portals. Um, so the chapter one covers the part general purpose of the standard. Chapter two covers the scope of the standard. Chapter three covers definitions. Most of our, our modifications to the definitions chapter was to pull in definitions from the House Bill 3409 or from activity that had happened in Washington that we wanted to have consistency in the Oregon program. Chapter four includes uh, modifications to the Oregon compliance requirements. Chapter five includes our modifications to the energy and emissions management plan, which is required for tier one buildings. Each covered building must develop and implement an energy and emissions plan. It still includes the consideration of greenhouse gas emissions. 
that is embedded in the ASHRAE standard 100, although our targets are based on site energy. So we have made some modifications to the standard to reflect our targets based on site energy and not greenhouse gas emissions. And then chapter six outlines the overview or the requirements for the operations and maintenance plans for tier one covered buildings. Chapter seven of the standards discusses the energy use and greenhouse gas emissions analysis and target requirements and that process for determining the EUI target. I think it was mentioned earlier about like mixed use buildings, buildings with multiple different types of occupancies within one structure. Uh, this chapter provides that weighted average calculation methodology for a building to determine what its average is if it does have multiple uses and, and multiple targets for different percentages of its floor space. Um, so there's a process for that within the standards. And it does, but we have removed the, any language referencing greenhouse gas intensity targets in the standard too, because our, our targets are based on site energy use. Um, similarly with chapter eight, energy audit with decarbonization assessment requirements, we've removed a lot of the, like some of the references throughout the standard to emissions reduction measures and mostly focused on energy efficiency measures. But our, our language, our proposed language for energy audits with decarbonization assessment remains because the feedback that we got from the RAC was that there was still a lot of value in when a building owner, if a building owner has to hire an auditor to come out and do an audit, perform an audit, assess potential measures to meet a building performance standard, EUI, that there's also a lot of value there if there's a quantification and a, an assessment of decarbonization opportunities because the bill ultimately does direct the program to max, seek to maximize greenhouse gas reductions. And we know that a lot of local jurisdictions, a lot of organizations have climate, um, climate strategies and climate reduction goals. So the decarbonization assessment component to that aligns with a lot of other factors that are ongoing in the, in the state and in local jurisdictions. And then chapter nine includes implementation and verification requirements and outlines the process for implementing the standard and um, we have modified part, parts of this chapter also to remove references to greenhouse gas intensity requirements and some emissions reduction measure references. We have a separate appendix proposed for the investment criteria pathway that's been modeled really closely off of Washington State's pathway. And this is the pathway that provides some cost effectiveness boundaries for a building owner. So, you know, one pathway is just meeting an energy use intensity target, but there's also an investment criteria pathway for a building owner to, if they don't meet the energy use intensity target, to perform an audit and then implement an optimized bundle of cost effective measures as another means for compliance. So there's some, some building owner protections, some cost effectiveness uh, side rails that are built into the, the program um, and built into a compliance pathway. Um, and then one other thing that I know has gotten a lot of attention um, and a lot of just interest, I guess, uh, over the last couple of RAC meetings and in some other discussions with our stakeholders is the requirement for utility data aggregation. The, the legislation, House Bill 3409, um, gave us the, uh, the ability to provide a requirement for energy data aggregation uh, for utilities to provide aggregated data to a building owner. So we've we've looked at some model policies, we've looked at what some other jurisdictions have done with regard to requiring this. And where this really comes into play is where there's a one building with multiple energy meters on it that has that then those individual meters might be owned and controlled by individual tenants. And the building owner who's responsible for overall BPS compliance might not have access to those individual meters. So um, what this draft language would do is it would point to some utilities and direct those utilities to provide aggregated energy data to a building owner as long as certain requirements are met. And some of those require requirements are meeting um, a, like a, an aggregation threshold. So like, for example, at least at least five meters on a multifamily building or at least three meters on a commercial building um, so that it's not as uh, apparent or as easy or, you know, a, a lot more challenging to identify individual meter usage if you're just getting whole building data over the course of a year 
um, from a, or over the course of one month, aggregated data, no individual or personally identifiable um, information associated with that. But I do want to open it up for a little bit of discussion on this item because we've we had some discussion. We received a lot of feedback on this during our RAC meetings, our, our, our last couple RAC meetings. And I know there's a lot of interest here um, in in uh, you know providing some additional input with this one. But I have uh, up on the screen here taken an excerpt from our draft rules, and I just wanted to take a little bit of time to, to go over some of the, the requirements that are in here um, and hopefully have an opportunity for some discussion and um, definitely welcome other comments to come in through the through the compliance portal too. But um, generally the draft rules would require that starting on January 1st of 2026, so this would provide about a you know, year for the covered utilities um, the, uh, that would be required to, to do this to uh, have developed the systems in place to be able to provide the aggregate data upon request from a building owner. So, and then it would require those utilities upon request to provide that data within 60 days. So some time frame. it wouldn't necessarily be um, like have to provide it one week later. It would give a little bit of time to uh, the utility to provide that response. So it's not like a building owner could expect to request the data a week before it's due for compliance and receive a turnaround on that data. Um, and then we've included draft language for the ability for a, an owner to request at least 60 months worth of data, and this aligns with the BPS compliance period, so the five-year compliance periods of covered usage data. Um, in doing benchmarking for what some other jurisdictions have done with regard to energy data aggregation, um, it, it's kind of mixed, but in some cases, there's a requirement for direct upload to Energy Star Portfolio Manager. We haven't gone that far in our draft rules. It would just require a utility to provide the data in an electronic format that's capable for upload. So no direct connection required like for a utility just to automatically electronically provide that data into Portfolio Manager, but it would be provided in a format that a building owner could take it and then upload it into Portfolio Manager. Um, and then just a couple other points here that uh, provide the data in monthly interval intervals. That's the way data is reported in the portfolio manager, and then also be provided at no cost to the qualified data recipient. Um, and then I'll just mention too that we tried to do a little bit of um, kind of, you know, we didn't want to set in terms of like which utilities, sometimes in doing our benchmarking, sometimes larger utilities have different requirements than smaller utilities in some other jurisdictions. So we, we looked to a similar sort of approach and um, tried to look to what other precedent might be available for what, what's a threshold for a small versus a large utility. And the only one that we, we really identified was the, um, the renewable portfolio standard that sets different requirements for utilities that have 3% or more of retail sales in the state. So we looked to the same, the same threshold um, for the purposes of this program in terms of like requiring those, lar those larger utilities, at least on the basis of percentage of sales to have the requirement to provide that aggregated data. And in most cases, um, you know, th this would include our, our larger investor owned electric utilities as well. Um, most of the covered buildings in the state are probably also going to be in our like more urban centers in our more urban areas too, um, where, where those IOUs are serving. But um, so just hopefully just provide the general overview of, of uh, where we were thinking um, where we kind of came up with this draft, but definitely uh, welcome any additional comments as we work through our rulemaking process here. Um, I'm not able to see the comments, but I do want to pause here for uh, to discuss any of this. Um, let me see if I can get my participant list back up. There we are. Uh, it looks like Kathleen has a hand raised. Yeah, thanks, Blake. Um yeah, it looks like captured one of the items I was going to bring up, which is mm -hmm. the turnaround time. So that's great to see that. Um, mm -hmm. I guess the other, the other piece I think would be helpful for clarity and maybe it doesn't need to be written here, but I think it would be important kind of on both sides, kind of an expectation of what information is needed in that written request. Um, is site address sufficient? They can have to be collecting all the meter um, and account information and just kind of clarification on kind of the granularity of, of data necessary. And hopefully that ideally that could be made consistent 
so that there's a kind of clear understanding, especially if, if customers have more than one utility, that that's consistent for them. And then it's also easy for the utilities as well to know kind of uh, know what they're going to be providing and that that's mm -hmm. consistent across the board for for simplicity on both sides. Yeah, thanks for thanks for that comment. Uh, ben? Uh, related note, um, it looks like it's set up by accounts versus meters. And I'm thinking about scenarios that we've had to play out in Portland where owners change, tenants change, um, metering changes, especially over the course of five years, even mm -hmm. over the course of one year, it happens. It's fairly frequent. Um, especially with like account holders changing and, and when you get to multifamily benchmarking, there's going to be a lot of turnover. And uh, is that something you all considered in the rules too with accounts? Like when you say five or more accounts or just say like for commercial three or more accounts over the course of five years, if there might only be one account holder, uh, but there could be three accounts over the course of five years. And like, how does that play out? And okay. so those, those types yeah, of I think that's I think I understand the question. We can definitely take a finer look at the language for meters versus accounts in the in the draft rules and how that might um, how that might affect the the requests. But that is something that that is addressed in some parts of the draft rules. For example, like if if building ownership changes, that it would still allow the current building owner to request data for the previous five years, regardless if they didn't have a business relationship with that utility three years ago. Um, so it wouldn't necessarily, so some, there was some language in the draft rules to address that, um, or it wouldn't necessarily be based on the account. It, it could be more like meter based, um, in that situation. So. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, Kara. Yeah, just a quick note of appreciation for making it really clear. I think as clear as possible for both customers customers and utilities um, about what's expected here in the utility aggregation. I think it's it's really helpful and would be curious to hear from any utilities that are on the rack if they have any concerns about um, how these are phrased. So we can we can kind of hear those concerns now and, and work through them if if necessary. And then Blake, there's also a question in the chat that's of interest, I think. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, I'll just read the question out loud. Um, for those who do have buildings in the utility areas with less than 3% of sales, would they still be required to comply with the regulation? Assuming yes, will Odo provide guidance or additional technical assistance to those buildings to help them access the utility use of their building? Um, so uh, the answer to the first part of the question is, is yes. Um, a building would be a covered building regardless of their utility service territory if they meet one of the, you know, one of the, the covered building criteria. Um, in those situations, even though a utility wouldn't necessarily be required to aggregate the data, um, we would still like definitely hope to be able to work with that utility and work with the building owner to gather that aggregated data, even if it's not a, a strict requirement. We did hear just some general concerns from some of our smaller utilities and more rural areas of the state about providing an overarching requirement um, across the state just due to additional resources needed to do something like that. Um, you know, we think in those in those smaller utility service territories, there's probably not as many covered buildings. So hopefully it's not as um, resource intensive a request if a utility needs to aggregate data periodically to meet um, you'll meet some covered building owners, but we would definitely look to collaborate and work with those smaller utilities to uh, to find resources to help aggregate that aggregate that data. Um, it's something that we've discussed through some, you know, there's there's some federal funding. We've got some incentive funding. We've we're definitely open as we look to develop that incentive program a little bit too. Perhaps there's some. Um, some portions of that funding that could be earmarked to to help and support um, building owners and utilities in situations like this. So, uh, okay. 
Um, I'm not seeing any more questions or hands raised or comments in the chat. So I can uh, move on to the next, but uh, I'll just say uh, we definitely welcome any any comments, especially from our, our utility rack members or, or other utilities in the state too, um, regarding these draft rules. So just to kind of cover what else is out there in the draft rules for review, um, we have the tier one covered buildings reporting requirements appendix. It's been modeled after Washington State's appendix, and it provides the reporting process and the requirements for tier one buildings, including building and energy information that will be required on their reporting forms when compliance time comes. Um, there's a, a variety of forms um, from you know form A that talks about compliance, like which pathway, you know, it provides an opportunity for the building owner to document which pathway they're using for compliance with the standard. Form B allows a calculation of building activity, provides a format for calculating the energy use target, form C for energy use intensity calculations, and, and so on, uh, things like energy audits, investment criteria. Um, I will say that the, the appendix itself provides the, the fields and the information that will be required to be collected on the, on the forms as part of compliance, but the, the actual compliance portal and the, the pathway for reporting compliance um, will be part of our, our future Oregon Building Performance Standard compliance portal. That format and the platform that we use is still to be determined. We're going through the, the, the software IT development scoping process now for that. We know that there's a couple off-the-shelf solutions for building performance standards compliance portals that we'll look to uh, for those. Um, the reporting schedule is also included in Tier 1 uh, Appendix Z. And it also includes the process for non-compliance penalties um, in terms of issuing notices of potential violation, notices of violation, the appeals process, the hearing process. That's all included in this tier one appendix as well. We've also provided the draft rules for the tier two covered buildings reporting requirements in appendix Y. So it's structured kind of similarly to the the tier one appendix in terms of reporting requirements, but it's a lot it's a lot shorter because it doesn't include any of the requirements for things like energy management plans, operations and maintenance plans for tier one buildings, because those are not required for tier two buildings. But what it does do is it provides the benchmarking requirements and reporting requirements for tier two buildings. Um, and those are, are to be done on, on three different forms. So instead of the, the list of um, you know, a dozen forms for tier one buildings. It's a much simpler process just for energy benchmarking and reporting for tier two buildings. Um, there's a form just for general compliance reporting, like the building owner, building, uh, you know, building energy manager name, who's, who's doing the reporting, the building activity, looking at, you know, we talked a little bit about how there are energy targets for tier two buildings that we're publishing now just for reference mainly, but um, associated with the energy use reporting would be a look and a comparison for how the tier two building compares to the energy target. And then um, actually just reporting the energy use intensity calculations and energy benchmarking. And this will all be done through Energy Star Portfolio Manager. But that uh, the tier two building requirements are all contained within that appendix. Why? So now we'll just take kind of the last part of the meeting today to talk about, you know, what's coming next, um, you know, the schedule for other activities related to, oh, it looks like Kara has a hand. I can, I can pause here. Yeah. For answering. Yeah. Sorry. Any questions yeah. So thank far. you. Before yeah. you, before yeah. you move on, um, I was, did a, just a quick control F to see if I could find anything, but I'm curious if I don't recall talking about this during the RAC meetings, mm -hmm. any kind of appeals process um, should mm -hmm. a building owner, uh, be designated incorrectly or have the wrong target. Um, is that something mm -hmm. that you thought about? Um, yeah, just curious if if that's something you thought about and, and how, or um, if it's been addressed. Um, the, the only part of the appeals process, uh, so there is an appeals process related to noncompliance. Right, so that that could feasibly be a pathway for if um, and you know we would we would definitely hope to like if there is any question about like where a building owner falls with regard to tier one tier two if they're over the building size threshold or not um, you know we would hope to get a lot of those questions answered before it actually got to providing a notice of violation but the appeals process is included in the um, tier one buildings appendix Z 
where you know we would issue a, a notice of violation and a building owner could appeal that appeal that violation and it would go to an administrative law judge for a kind of a third party review of the situation and an ultimate finding. Yeah. But you know we would hope to I, I think as part of our you know it was presented earlier that we're going to be notifying the covered building owners that we're aware of that you know that we get uh, good data on we're working with our tax assessor, our county tax assessors now to, to identify the building stock. Um, and as part of that process, I think it'll be a little bit of, um, you know, we've identified this building that's over the square footage. We think it's a covered building. Help us understand what you're uh, like. If you, as a building owner, don't feel it's a covered building for these reasons, help us understand that if it's maybe exempt, um, if the square footage that we have is way off and Turns out it's a lot smaller building and it's not um, it's not actually a covered building, but I think that'll be a little bit part of our building owner notification process and further definition of our building stock. Right. But if Thanks, it ever did get to a point, yeah, where we thought there was a covered building, then there would be that appeals process. Yeah. Good question. Um, um, Adam. Yeah, a question, question on how uh, to deal with campuses. Uh, we have a couple mm -hmm. of campuses with very connected building energy uh, meters um, mm -hmm. and how that would be addressed in this process. Yeah, it's a, it, it's a good question. So, um, the, in, in those cases where you might have like a mix of different buildings that, you know, maybe some tier 1 buildings, some tier 2 buildings, some covered buildings, some uncovered buildings. If. The entire, like, say, say you've just got a mix of buildings that are all, you know, maybe there's one tier one building that needs to meet the compliance or BPS requirements, but a bunch of other buildings that don't, and they're all in one meter. In those situations, there'd be some flexibility for a building owner to either sub meter out that one building that's covered and only comply um, for that building on its EUI target pathway or the investment criteria pathway. So a building owner could choose to install sub meters if that's more cost effective if that's the desirable strategy. Another option could be to, um, you know, if sub metering is, is uh, you know, not desired to follow the investment criteria pathway for the, for the entire, um, you know, for that covered building, because it doesn't, it can't tell how it performs relative to its target. And in that case, the investment criteria pathway would only be required for the covered building itself. So you would have to do an energy audit on that building install the uh, cost effective bundle of measures, um, but only for the tier one building in that case. Yeah, um, and I will mention too that there is one of the recent um, updates that Washington state picked up was a pathway for district energy system decarbonization pathways um, for compliance. So this is a, a case where, you know, maybe a campus has a district energy steam system or district cooling. Um, that this would be a pathway to, instead of complying on an individual building basis, that uh, that campus could develop a decarbonization plan for their district energy system over 15 years. And it would essentially just kind of push out the, the BPS compliance for 15 years to give the building owner some time to decarbonize their central system, their central plant. Um, so th th there's yeah, a thinking... pathway that might be applicable for a, a campus type system. Yeah, I was thinking more of just uh, the straight reporting requirements. The city of Portland uh, and all of our uh, Energy Star benchmark is kind of set up for buildings that have common utilities are set up as campuses in their system. Uh, yeah. And obviously, yeah, okay. it'd be easy if that was kind of carried forward into into this. Right. Okay. Yeah, I understand. For like the tier two buildings, like energy benchmarking, yeah, those would be still um, following the same sort of. Um, like net set set up as um, as portfolio manager allows to, where you can set up like the parent and the the child properties and on a campus. Yep. Yep. Um, uh, I wanted to clarify just real quick. Oh yeah, I have a question I'll yeah. save for later. But um, the and instead of using the parent child campus energy feature. Uh, Portland allows campuses to s submit one virtual meter uh, that matches their um, district metering. So, like, okay. if you have one district steam plant 
for instance, or campus steam plant, then all of the buildings that are attached to that one steam plant would then be associated with one meter as a virtual building. And mm -hmm. uh, rather than calling out each of the buildings individually, so uh, it is, it's different than the parent child format. Oh, okay, I understand. Simpler. Yeah. yeah. Uh, looks like Rachel has a hand raised. Hi, yeah. Um, I have a question about the EUI calculation for both the benchmarking purposes, what you've done so far in terms of averaging as well as setting the targets for future. And I'm curious, I'm sorry if I missed it, but are the are in both cases is um if you've got uh buildings with solar that's net metered into into um one of the meters in the building, is the solar stripped out of that in terms of identifying the average EUI for each of those building types for the benchmark? And then for moving forward mm -hmm. as you're setting performance targets, is there also going to be a stripped out kind of pure energy use, you know, EY? A not a non net EUI um, set as mm -hmm. a performance target, or will solar contribute to achieving the target EUI in buildings? When yeah, um, yeah, um, yeah I, I think the, sh the short answer that I think addresses your question is that the performance is based on net energy usage, and solar can contribute to meeting a BPS EUI. Does that answer the? Questions. Yeah, so so your yeah. benchmarks is going is are a combination of buildings that have solar included to to reduce the EY as well as buildings that don't have solar. So it's a mix in terms it, of it is it is a mix. Yeah, and I don't think we uh, maybe the SPW team can can weigh in, but I don't think we necessarily have the visibility in the like all the CVSA and CBEX data to to tell like which buildings do and don't have solar. So I, I imagine it is a mix across all the buildings. Some probably do have solar and some don't. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. I imagine that has a uh, would would have a big impact on mm -hmm. I mean depending on you know, certain building types may better access to solar or or in different climate zones and may have a really big impact mm -hmm. on the overall average um EY or, or as a benchmark for some buildings. I'm just curious that how much of a factor that might be um, that maybe it's not a big factor, but. Yeah, I don't I don't see anybody from the SBW team. Um, maybe we can address that, but. Um, uh, it looks like Michael is a has a hand raised, but that's something we can look into a little more. Thanks for the, the comment. Thanks, uh, Michael. Art. Yeah, um, for district energy systems that are coming in, commercial ones that are you know coming into a neighborhood and serving multiple private buildings, how mm -hmm. is that going to be f served on this? Is it just going to be focused on the building only and you know deal with it on that level, or are we going to be looking at it as a whole district? Like a campus style. So I, I believe the way that the the district energy pathway in Appendix W, it's more um, structured where the like the the owner of a campus is maybe also the owner of the district energy system too. Um, I'm trying to think of a situation that matches with what you're maybe describing. Um, you know, or you have so you have Vancouver or he has one that's in process. Uh, BC, but here in Seattle, we're going to be having mm -hmm. one developed up on first hill, or it's going to be serving okay. the hospital and a couple other private buildings. Okay, um, like private buildings that could potentially be covered buildings. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it'd be a hospital, yeah. long term care facility, condominium, mm -hmm. etc. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, in those situations, I would expect that the. You know, the primary method for compliance would just be like, if a private building owner is buying chilled water or steam or hot water. From a district energy system, it would be the same approach as treating that as like incoming energy. Yep. To the building boundary, similar to natural gas or to electricity. So, it'd be a smaller provider though. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 
um, uh, Vin. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, another question for you on the tier two rules. Uh, it looks like there's reference to using data exchange, and that's a format that we've considered going to as well, especially if we have multifamily covered in the future mm -hmm. um, for kind of ease of reporting. But you also have reports too, and, and they, that looks a little more like how we currently have our commercial benchmark game, which is a, using the reporting template feature. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason why you might have like both of those or are you considering both options and blended with both? Because um, we're trying to sort through that as well. Okay. Yeah. Um, no, I think we're just looking to have as much integrate potential integration with portfolio manager as we can after, you know, we'll have to go through the process of our, um, our compliance portal too. Um, so, yeah, I don't know that I can specifically like address both of those like options. Um, right now, but definitely willing and you know want happy to happy to have more discussion to align with your process too in Portland. So yeah, that that might be good for follow up, especially like around the utility data aggregation, how that fits into okay um, and gets reported through uh, portfolio manager. Okay. Um, one other comment uh, to share on tier two in the potential error section. There's reference to gross flow area. Mm -hmm. um, I think one other condition, and those those make sense. But we um, to Poppy's point earlier, we do see um, self-reported information that uh, on energy use intensity that can be really far off because of um, the uh, metering information. So um, I think about a third of our uh, building owners uh, choose the utility data aggregation of some format, but then two thirds of them do some self-entry too because. They don't have tenants or own occupied um, and there's often errors in there too that will flag for them like a an eui that's at uh, 100 times higher than it should be for instance to, yeah um or or apparently like the metering is just it's so little it's not making sense either unless it's a completely vacant building and so we'll just do follow up with folks so have, have you all thought about that listing that as a potential error as well oh i i think it's a good comment yeah, about like uh, you're, you're talking about like as a potential error, like an EUI that's just like way out of range. It's yeah, it's a yeah. data entry error in the mm -hmm. entry of therms or kilowatt hours that is fairly common. Okay. Into portfolio manager, so I might recommend if, if that's something not something you already considered, I'd recommend yeah. putting okay. that in your list. Yeah, great, thanks. That's a, that's a good comment. And I have one other question too. We talked about at one point with uh, EVs, electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. Is there guidance within the draft rules for um, metering of electric vehicles? I think portfolio managers trying to accommodate electric vehicles in the like future versions. EPA has been looking right. at that, but yeah. uh, it seems like there would be an incentive to not have electric vehicles if it's going to push you over an average EUI target. Mm -hmm. um, right now, the way that that's addressed in the rules is it would allow for, you know, where submetering, where you can determine the kilowatt hours that goes to or toward charging electric vehicle, um, you can subtract that out of your building usage, but it also allows for estimation of that usage. So somebody could, you know, a building owner could use the feature that's now being integrated in a portfolio manager to estimate and let an EV charging um usage and you know we we recognize and, and understand that that might not be completely accurate in in all cases but um you know right now it does allow for that estimation and somebody could use the portfolio manager pathway or another another side calculation to to do that um that's something that we'll definitely continue to look at as like how much you know what sort of error that might introduce into into a building owner's reporting um but right now, the rules do allow for either direct measurement or estimation. Thank you. Yep. All right. Thanks for the good comments and, and questions there. Um, so now just to cover a little bit about what's coming next, not necessarily regarded to these rules that will be filed by the end of the year, but we are working with ASHRAE as an organization to develop an integrated Oregon version of Standard 100. 
um, that will be available for download on the Odo website. So somebody doesn't need to purchase standard 100, but they'd be able to just download for free um, and no cost the the Oregon modified integrated version of standard 100. If if you've worked in Washington, it's the uh, a similar sort of process where you would just need to provide a little bit of information about who you are, your name, and um, how you intend to use the standard, and then and then download it with all of the the modifications that we made. Um, oh, I do see a comment about uh, sending participants a uh, a link to this presentation. Um, it, it is up on our website, up on our rulemaking website, and I can put a link to that in the chat here in a minute. Um, uh, the next rulemaking that we'll do as an agency is to develop the incentive program for early and voluntary adoption. Um, you know, we think we'll we'll kick off this process probably before the end of the year, and hope to have a lot of those considerations built into an incentive framework by mid-2025. Uh, we know there's a lot of considerations with regard to this. We've done a little bit of research and, and benchmarking for other jurisdictions around the country that have uh, BPS incentive programs for early and voluntary adoption and how we might want to take some lessons learned from those programs and build them into the way that we approach incentives. But some of those considerations include, so the, the legislation allows for, for example, up to 85 cents a square foot for earlier voluntary compliance with the building performance standard. Um, you know, what does that mean in terms of like when the incentives provided? Um, is there maybe an opportunity or a need for some incentive funding provided for planning activities that don't necessarily achieve an energy reduction on their own, but help a building owner get there? So we're going to be looking at the, the flexibility and the, the opportunities for those like energy audits, developing an energy management plan. Might there be some some portions of incentives that are helpful for building owners to, to get started there. Um, equitable distribution, how do we allocate some of the funding for potentially different uh, different sectors to make sure that um, that those sectors have access to, to some of the incentives. So, um, and I would love if, if any folks that want to be involved with uh, the incentive rulemaking um, that have been involved with our RAC process, um, that, that would be great. Uh, and then the one of the things that we're working on now is collecting data from our county tax assessors to identify covered buildings. We've uh, started to get some really good responses in from our county tax assessors with lots of data, um, sometimes in like really complex and comprehensive shape files, uh, pretty comprehensive Excel or, or CSV spreadsheets um, where they provided some great, great data. And we're starting to get more and more of that in. And that's ultimately toward our uh, process for notifying building owners by July 1st of next year, um, whether or like if we think they're a covered building, and then continuing to work with those building owners to hopefully reach out and connect and educate what the requirements are. We know that that's going to be a, a, a pretty big lift, um, and we we'll definitely look to a lot of our lot of our partners to to help educate building owners and um, inform them of the requirements as we start to develop more and more educational materials for compliance pathways, how to meet the requirements and, and things like that. Um, and that's kind of the next item, develop education activities and implementation materials for building owner and industry support, more materials out there for how to how to comply, what are the compliance pathways, um, what are the requirements, we'll be doing more just outreach and stakeholder education over the over the coming years. And then the the other piece that we're working on now, going through our software evaluation and our state IT software project management process, is to look at the building performance standards reporting compliance portal. Um, I mentioned before that there's a couple off the shelf kind of packaged solutions that have been presented uh, that have kind of presented themselves in the in the marketplace that some other jurisdictions are are looking to, and, and we're looking to those two as the as the pathway for a building owner and for us to to manage our stock of covered buildings and manage our connection with the building owners for actually reporting compliance into the future. So, and we looked at, that's that that's somewhat of, a, of an involved process from our, our state procurement IT development side. Um, and we're looking to have that system um, somewhat, you know, hopefully available in early 26, 2026. Just as a rough timeline, some dates may change. 
And with with that, that covers the the end of my presentation. Um, again, we've got our rulemaking uh, website up here. Um, maybe I can just click on that. Yeah, and I'll I'll put this in the chat. But we do have our um, opportunity for public comment portals up here on the top of the website. All of the draft rules themselves are also here, and then we've got links to the meeting presentations under today's under today's meeting too. So um, I will see if I can find the chat, and I'll just drop that link in there again. Um, and so that that's the end of the presentation. I'd like to thank everybody for attending, and especially all of our advisory committee members who have been so engaged and provided uh, such thoughtful and helpful input along the way. So I'm happy to answer any other questions now if there if there are any. I'll uh, take the screen share down so I can see folks a little bit better. But I can revisit any slides if they're needed. Um, let's see. I'm not seeing any comments or questions come in, but um, oh, uh, Kara. Thanks, Blake. Uh, yeah, so just a quick question. You very helpfully walked us through the um, feedback that you had as of the last meeting, maybe, or the meeting before. Mm -hmm. Are you anticipating putting additional feedback as it comes in on the website, or do you will you capture all of it? And then um, mm -hmm. once comment closes, that feedback will be available. Yeah, I we're going through the comments as they as they come in, kind of gathering them on a on a weekly basis and summarizing them internally. But I think we'll we'll roll up all of those comments after the end of the public comment period and kind of group them and then have some sort of a, a high level response of how we're gonna, you know, how how we plan to address those. So I think it'll be kind of one one rolled up compiled response at the end of the public comment period. Uh, let's see, yeah, Kathleen. Thanks. This is kind of a granular question, but just something that okay. has been on my mind to help us kind of prepare our customers. Um, yeah. It doesn't say explicitly about the built, the qualified building auditor. Uh, but my question is whether they can. It's okay for them to be an employee of oh, yeah. of the building owner. Um, they don't need to be a third party. I don't think it says anything about them being a third party. But I just want to make sure mm -hmm. that we. Are safe kind of promoting them kind of being getting prepared by maybe training up their staff right. and just want to clarify uh, that. Yes, um, it as long as they meet 1 of those certification requirements, they could be a, okay. a qualified building auditor independent of who they work for. Okay, so, great. Thank yeah. you. I don't see any other hands raised. I'm happy to hang on for a few more minutes if, if folks do have any questions. Otherwise, you know how to how to reach us um, if you do have any any more comments or questions along the way. So, um, please feel free to attend the public comment hearing on November uh, 13th if you can. All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Blake. Thanks, everybody.